Welcome to the Anti-Discrimination, Anti-Bullying and Harassment webinar for Southern Cross Group. My name is Scott Taylor, I'm the Chief Operating Officer for the organisation, and I'll be sharing with you today some content just to reiterate about our values and our, our, our complete zero tolerance approach to any behaviour like relating to discrimination, uh, bullying or harassment. One of the other things with regards to this program is I'll give you some content to help challenge your thinking, I suppose, as to what you may have traditionally thought as being what are the limits of, of bullying behaviour as well. When we say build, uh, bullying behaviour, we instantly go to things such as, you know, pushing, pushing, shoving and, and some of the physical elements. So uh, throughout the session for today, you, you'll get a, a couple of, a bit of an insight as to, I suppose, the depth and, uh, and some of the, um, uh, I suppose, unusual elements that happen within the workplace with regards to these items. So the first uh, part that I want to do for with the program is to cover off just to give you some some base information as to the, the reason why why this is important why are we doing this sort of training what sort of content is it that, that we want to be sharing and, and to make sure you really get the sound sound takeaways from this. So with regards to our claims uh, in regards to the mental disorder claims that luckily they get filed as you can see from with that you this current slide. One in three women and one in five men state that that's occurred due to bullying or harassment in, in some format. And as I said, when we get down to a bit more content there, you'll understand that bullying, harassing behaviour is not just the traditional elements as you may have thought. The other points of note there is uh, that almost 20% of workers say they've experienced discomfort from sexual humour. Now that can be in many forms. And as part of, like I suppose, uh, traditionally and within the security industry, there's times that we work unusual hours, lengthy periods with people. And what can happen is sometimes the relationship dynamic can go from being purely professional to a bit more friendly. That can follow up then like you with communications, uh, like you, and sometimes even you know, communication on social networks and others. What happens like you, during that time then is, is um, elements of, I suppose, boundaries and others like it yeah, can be perceived to be adjusted. And so things such as showing images or like or content in other parts as well, these sort of things like yeah, can occur. And I, I want to make sure I state at the outset that um, that in 100%, there is a zero tolerance approach that we have with regards to any behaviour of intimidating, uh, intimidation or bullying, harassment, discrimination. And as the, one of the reasons for this training is to really make sure that throughout the workforce, everyone has 100% aware awareness as to what would constitute that sort of behaviour and conduct, and also what our stance and approach would be uh, with regards to, to, to should this occur. Also state said 22% of workers uh, report being physically assaulted or threatened, and it says by patients or clients. So I wanna talk about that for a second as well. Especially over the last 12 to 18 months, um, if you speak to and read some reports from Dominic Lamb from the Retail Association, uh, there's been close to 100% increase in violence and aggression in the retail space. In different states with the healthcare space as well, um, between 75 to 80 in New South Wales and even more like in Victoria and some of the other states within the healthcare space. So part of it as well is it's not just about, um, I suppose, when we're talking about bullying, harassment and this type of behaviour, it's important to note that it's not just internal. And it's not just especially with some of these um, elements with regards to, to bullying superiors to subordinates. So I really want to challenge your thinking for with this, like to understand like that we need to enhance our awareness of this, these sort of things occurring. And we need to make sure that we're unified as an organization and including the sphere of influence we have around us, which includes our clients, our staff, suppliers as well to make sure that we always make every single effort that for every workplace that we're in um, is, is safe uh, from a physical, but also from a mental health point of view as well. So some other information um, like you're there just to provide, and this is a, a, another example of a slide that's been provided by, um, I think, Shine Lawyers. Uh, more than a third of Australian women have been the victim of sexual harassment or discrimination in the workplace. So we're going to drill down a little bit on that on, on in regards to the discrimination and also sexual harassment, what would constitute that sort of behaviour? Because I think it's really important to understand and make sure you've got a deep understanding as to what would constitute that. As I said, things from the what we would traditionally think, such as even bullying behaviour and that physical pushing and shoving, things occur such as cyberbullying, social and relational bullying, and a range of other things. So that's it's really important that you that you get these key takeaways away, like you're from, from with this program. If you look at the comparison there as well, um, only one in 20 men admit to being, you know, like a harassed women at work. So basically from that perspective, 
it can be about the fact that either you know, from a self-perception point of view or an understanding as well. And when we really drill down into some of those things today, I, I hope that that will challenge some of you thinking around this space. So some of the things we're going to cover off an understanding of the, of the relevant legislation, because it's important to understand the legislation and who the regulators are that assist with managing complaints, conciliations and actions in and around this space. We're going to step through um, so there's an understanding as to what would be considered bullying, harassing and discriminating behaviour. We'll also run through the requirements for reporting and how to effectively manage like that, that behaviour and conduct, because that's another important part as well, just for being aware of like, what our duties and responsibilities are. Should we become aware of this behaviour and conduct? Um, what are our responsibilities for how we manage that, for how we report that as well? And we're also going to cover off uh, some external reporting options. So aside from what should happen within the organisation about communicating, should you be the victim of bullying harassment or should you witness some of this behaviour occurring? What are the key steps that should be taken and what are the reporting elements that need to be, need to be covered off as well? So before I get into, I suppose, a bit of an overview um, about the different type of behaviour and conduct, I want to share some, some recent information from a study that was done from Unions ACT. So three unions like you did a combined survey um, across multiple workplaces and just to get to, to, to glean some feedback. So this is probably the most current survey in this space. To give you some of the specifics, I suppose, and key outcomes with that, 81.3% um, of women and gender diverse workers report being subject to abuse and bullying within the workplace, 81.3%. 67% of all, of all people that responded said at some time they felt sexualized or had experienced some form of sexual harassment in and around the workplace. And disturbingly, less than 65% of the people that were surveyed said that their organization took a zero tolerance approach to sexism. So tying some of these things together, as I said, we've got the, obviously this is an important, like an incredibly important issue at so many different levels, um, like, yeah, like yeah, for us to work through. But we need to, I need to state at the outset that everybody has a role to play with this. Because when, as we delve further into this information, you'll realise that it's about the person's reception of the behaviour or the content um, that, like, yeah, like yeah, that determines as to whether it's been intimidating like yeah, or inappropriate conduct as well. And that's a really important part for us to understand. And for the people that are on this or listening to this, that are leaders and managers as well, there will be some times during your working life where somebody, you know, where you get an issue or complaint raised to you and your natural response is, I actually don't think that that's that bad or that hasn't really, um, for whatever reason, hasn't really struck me as being inappropriate. We're all individuals that have our own individual historical makeup, life experiences, and a range of other things. And you know, the way that we speak sometimes at home or around with siblings or friends and others may be different. They're how we speak in the workplace. But it's important to understand that because we have that individual makeup, that individual life experiences and a range of other things, is so it's based on the individual as to what they would deem being inappropriate conduct. So it's really important to understand that because in essence. Um, it's not a, you know, one approach fits all, which I think is important for us to cover off as well. From the legislative point of view, it's 100% um, completely unlawful under the legislation. Um, and the first point we'll cover off here is about from the anti-discrimination um, legislation. Uh, so it's, it's unlawful like you're, like you're for sexual harassment and discrimination to occur under you know, the Equal Employment Opportunity like you're, like you're Framework and like our regulations workplace relations and also under the human rights laws as well. So from the New South Wales point of view, um, because of like the first part where this is going to be shared and shown, um, it's the anti-discrimination New South Wales, like you looked at manage that and oversee managing uh, the complaints, the initial conciliation part as well, but also they manage um, education campaigns and programs as well to help enhance awareness about these sort of things occurring. From a national point of view, the Australia Wide Disability Discrimination Act um, you know, comes into play. And for people that are like it, so across our national footprint to be aware as well, is that it's unlawful for an employee to discriminate against somebody with a disability without making reasonable efforts to make adjustments. That's to the workplace, to the duties and others with what would be considered reasonable. So that's something as an employer that we need to be taking into account. The key point of difference, I think, is when we talk about workplace health and safety and others, is we say that workplace health and safety, I suppose, the, the initial position um, that we go to is 
Workplace health and safety is considered being about the physical elements. Is it safe? There's no slip, trip, falls. You know, the, the electric cords are tagged and tested in others. But it's it's important for us to understand that the, the, the health and safety legislation requires us as far as practicable to be both physically and mentally safe um, and healthy for all employees. So that means how we manage situations like bullying, harassment, discrimination and others form a really integral part about how safe and well the workplaces are that we're going to, that, you know, that we're going to be working in. On the national front, it's the Australian Human Rights Commission um, that, that helps them, like you manage and oversee you know, the can, complaints, then the follow-up conciliation liaison and other parts as well with regards to bullying, harassment and, and discrimination. So um, one of the last slides I have for this has got all the details for the different industry regulators and a little bit more about the role that they play as well. Um, so if somebody listening to this, if you're feeling that you're the victim of, of your bullying, harassing, intimidating and discriminating type behaviour, uh, then you, there's some information towards the end of this as well that, that give you some direct contact details that you can, that you can utilise. So where are we now? I mean, that, that I suppose is a really important part for us to discuss, like to mention and discuss as an organisation right now. Should we do a survey 100% across the entire footprint? And regardless, if you're one of our suppliers, one of our clients listening to this now for with your own workplace or work site. If asked everybody, honestly, do we believe that we have 100% like your, like your, um, transparency and the right positive framework when it comes to bullying, harassing, and discriminating behaviour? I think any organisation would, you know, look at would, would you, if they're going to be completely honest, hand on heart, um, would have to say no, because there's always more that we can do from a communication point of view. And when I share some more information about relational and social, like you know, type bullying, cyber bullying, and other parts of things in that as well, you realise there's things that we can always do and continue to improve as an organisation to always get better. I said for working towards that where the where every element of the safe of the workplace from a physical and mental point of view is safe and healthy and part of that can just be about the fact by propping up the awareness with this and reminding uh, everybody within our workforce of the importance of respecting the differences with like you within each other respecting each other's opinions and values as well so aside from the organizational point of view then the other point is from the personal point of view if you're a supervisor, manager, leader, who's like you're listening to this at the moment, do you think that you have the right skills to be able to deal with these things effectively? Because it's not just about dealing with an alleged complaint or an issue. Or an issue. It's about the fact that how do you manage the ongoing team dynamic? How do you manage the communication elements? How do you sometimes manage situations that because of historical dynamic or if there's long-term um, you know, people involved, then how do you manage that effectively like you're towards that outcome to make sure it's managed in a fair an equitable manner as well. So there's some elements, of, I suppose, of self-reflection that I think are important. Speak up is a really important part. Um, and, and I suppose we'll, I'll put this in early, even before some of the parts of the description, and I'll refer back to it as well. This really speaks to the organisational culture because a key driver when people uh, think about when it comes to, to harassing behaviour like and discriminating behaviour, all these sort of things as well, a key driver of that can be poor leadership, poor organisational culture. If the organisation is very clear and direct about the zero tolerance like to these sort of things occurring, and more importantly, the workforce feel 100% supported to know that if at any time you're undergoing or feeling the victim of behavioural conduct that's inappropriate, bullying, harassing, intimidating type behaviour and conduct, then you need to feel comfortable in raising that because it will then get reviewed and investigated without reprisal. I'll talk a little bit later on about protected activities because if somebody actually raises um, like, a, you know, like a complaint or situation to you around discriminating, bullying, harassing type behaviour, then it's a protected activity. That occurs where they cannot have any reprisal on others as well. And we'll talk about that, uh, about that like a little bit um, later on as well. So from the organisational values and approach that we need that we need to have in place, we need to be open, honest, direct and frank about feedback with this. Not just if you're just the person that's actually like suffering or the victim of this type of behavioural conduct. If you witness this sort of behaviour occurring, you need to be able to speak up. That's part of the organisational culture and values and that supportive self-regulating culture is that we value our people, their differences like, 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 as well, and that we want to make sure that everybody um, it, like it is free from violence, aggression, intimidating uh, behaviour, uh, inappropriate behaviour. And for that is to just to make sure that you know 
that you can always communicate your direct report about, like about these, these sort of circumstances. And if it's about your direct report, then you follow the chain of command um, like you know, for, for following that up, that up as well. So from the bullying point of view, what is, what is bullying? Bullying um, is behavior by an individual or group repeated over time that intentionally targets an individual or group physically or emotionally. That behavior flows on to create a risk to health and safety. So a couple of things you can note like in there as well. First one being about usually repeated and the second one being there about intentionally targets. With the type of bullying that we're going to be stepping through and some of the examples of bullying I've mentioned and sort of like in, in um, you know, related to this before, some of the ones we're across, I suppose, would be like the physical bullying. It's the natural one we think of. When we think bullying, we think schoolyard bullying, take um, a kid's bag and pushing and shoving and these sort of things. And it is much, much broader than that. So there's verbal bullying, which is taunting, threatening, inappropriate conduct, and like and the way and, and comments, the way the conversations are managed. Social bullying, or what's also called relational bullying, is something that sadly is on the on the increase and that occurs within the workplace. That's taking actions or um, managing interactions and in other parts as well that can hurt a person's relationship, their reputation, or even their performance within the workplace. So examples of relational or social bullying can be things such as. If there's an update in new procedures and things, not sharing that information with somebody, not letting them know within the workplace if there's social events and things occurring so they feel more isolated, those sort of things. So hopefully you start to get a bit of a better feel now for with this. And when we talk about bullying and others, I said it's not just those physical elements. There is still obviously elements of the physical bullying, which is you know hurting a person or like or for with their possessions as well. And uh, another part like that, that unfortunately is on the rise is, is cyberbullying. And, and we'll talk a little bit that in, in a little bit more detail in, I think, two or three slides from now. But the social or relational bullying is really, really important to understand because from that isolation point of view, and like yeah, that, that occurs there, if you're a supervisor or a leader within the workplace, they can sometimes be difficult things to pick up. Some of the others when it comes to physical or like, yeah, like or verbal bullying, People can be more direct and upfront about and relate. But when you come to social bullying, which in, in essence, some of the elements can be more of a gray area, people can be more hesitant in coming forward with that. But it's no less important and has no less impact than the other types of bullying that I've already covered off with you. From a bullying point of view, it's important to understand as well that it's not just about the two the people involved or two or three people involved. It flows onto the entire workplace for multiple reasons. The fact that especially in some workplaces and work sites, there can be a close dynamic as well, uh, where people have worked together for some, for some time, means that from the communication point of view, there's flow on conversations, side conversations and a range of other things. And if it's not managed well within the workplace, then the flow on can be poor morale, uh, absenteeism, a range of other things, and obviously reputational damage for the organisation as well as individuals. So having positive leadership around this and a very positive organisational culture is a key part to make sure that, the, that, that we ensure that this does not occur. Making sure, as I said, there's that very clear communication and consistent approach throughout. So everybody within our sphere of influence and within the workplace know that in no way do we tolerate any form of this type of behaviour and conduct and that everybody is free to be able to raise like, like any instances of this like onto us for review and investigation without, without reprisal, which is, which is, as I said, a crucial point to understand. So cyberbullying uh, is one that I suppose generically people may think as well cyberbullying is also oh, that's the messages and things over Facebook. Um, and there's a whole range of different elements that go within that. In essence, cyberbullying is in any form using technology to bully someone. So when someone's tormented, harassed, threatened, uh, embarrassed, or any other way, lucky, lucky, but utilizing technology. So that just doesn't mean those threatening messages over Facebook or things as well. It can mean about, like I'd, I'd referred to before, elements of relational bullying where there's some crossover there, not giving access to a system, not giving you um, awareness of change to policies, procedures or information for things in that as well. Any way, in essence, that technology is being used towards bullying, like it's bullying someone, you know, is what's considered cyberbullying. And as I said, unfortunately, cyberbullying bullying and relational or social bullying um, is two of the, the items that like are the areas that, 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 are, that are on the increase. So I look at, at everybody as being leaders because leaders have a key attribute, which is the ability to influence. 
by our values, by our actions, we have the ability to influence people around us. And so when I communicate about what we're going to do, I say as leaders, because, you know, we need to self-manage, we need to set a good example for others, we need to walk the talk. So as a leader, we need to make sure we always behave in ways that promote safety, welfare, uh, the, the positive welfare and well-being of staff, customers and our suppliers as well. That we can observe all relevant legislation and policies. And if at any time there's any doubt or concern we have about the behaviour conduct framework that we're working within, then we need to raise that and be comfortable in raising that for the supervisors as well. Um, whether that be then through under CX manager, regional managers, looking at, looking at, looking at, and above. But that open communication framework, being able to, like, yeah, to, to have an awareness that you can communicate and report things such as this is a really key part from that organisational culture to make sure that all boats are rowing in the same direction. We need to be aligned from that, from that values perspective. The other things is what we will do from a report point of view, that we will report if there's allegations of wrongdoings, risks of harm to people, and if there's corrupt, inappropriate actions, conduct, and, and obviously, like a key focal point for with the, the discussion today, any behavioural conduct that's bullying, harassing or discriminating is that it needs to be reported, it needs to be passed on, it needs to be escalated up the chain for us to be able to assist and support. And as I said, these are protected activities should you raise that. So in no way is there any form of reprisal or should this occur. I put in the power and control wheel because um, this is something to give you, I suppose, some more insight in regards to some of the different forms and elements that occur, you know, I suppose, within this fear between the, you know, the bullying, harassing like type behaviour. So as you can see, they're using coercion and threats, intimidation, emotional abuse, isolation as well. Uh, so controlling what people do, who they work with, what uh, partnerships or dealings that they have like within the workplace using co-workers as well, and that can be part of the us and them, uh, which can occur as well. And it's important, especially for the, lead, the leaders that are listening to this, for picking up on these sort of things. If you're seeing isol isolation groups, you're seeing some of that, like yeah, that, that bonding or us and them type mentality, it's really important to be proactive in managing that to ensure that this, um, that this doesn't continue and, and make sure that it doesn't escalate. Things such as using economic um, uh, abuse, and I'll talk a little bit later on about Quid, uh, quid pro quo sexual harassment as well. That's when somebody is in a position of authority or other parts and they use that um, basically in, in essence for things such as sexual favours and others for holding against or holding over people. And if these people don't do what they ask, then there's some forms of reprisal, which can mean uh, changes in working conditions, changes in pay, change in position, all those sort of things. So I so said that's, um, we'll, we'll drill down a little bit more specific on that um, a, a bit later on as we're running through this. I like to provide some very simple concepts, like it as well, some things that are like there's some good, easy takeaways out of this. And this is one of them. Regardless of how bullying is manifested in whatever format like that it occurs, verbal assaults, so physical, social, relational bullying, uh, it's moves to render like the target unproductive and unsuccessful. And it's based on the aggressor's desire to control the target that made that that's what's motivating and driving the action. It's that fact that like for whatever reason, whether it be that not giving people access to a system or filling them in or uh, managing the interaction with people so they feel intimidated or other parts as well, it's elements of power and control uh, like the drive for that. While sometimes the excuse can be used, oh, no, it's just a joke. We're just looking, like you're mucking around for with that person. That is in no form any type of excuse. Um, no, no excuse at all. So we're going to, to step onto and share some content now with regards to sexual harassment. Sexual harassment um, is 100% like that, like against the law. And, and as, as aligned with, with the other elements we're covering off today, Southern Cross Group has a 100% zero tolerance when it comes to any behaviour or conduct or, sexual, or like of a sexual harassing nature. So any um, conduct and unwelcome behaviour of a sexual nature that makes somebody feel offended, humiliated or intimidated and in whatever format, physical, verbal or written. So I've mentioned that before that and you can see the words there that makes you feel so it's about the person who is receiving or how they're perceiving like this conduct for being inappropriate to give you an example if there is four people there um, and one person is telling a joke two of the other people laughing but that last person is feeling very offended by the conduct then for that person that is offensive or inappropriate behavior and conduct and that's why we need to be mindful of the values um, and, like, you know, and respect the values and differences like you know, when you're with each other. 
So some examples across here of, of sexual harassment, you can see verbal, written, physical, uh, non-verbal and, and visual. So without going a point by point slide review for you for, for, for with this, because you can feel free to pause and have a look at this content at any time as well. From the verbal point of view, the comments uh, like about uh, of a sexual type nature of things as well, that can be about how somebody's looking, what they're wearing, other parts in that as well, or just leading that conversation down that part. Physical, and you can see the very first one there is impeding or blocking um, somebody's physical movement. I was asked to provide some advice and support for an organization uh, where they had like a, a claim uh, with regards to some, uh, like, you know, some physical harassment that, that occurred on site. And when I was reviewing the statements and reviewing and had asked to have a look at the footage, the manager that I was dealing with there had said, so I can't see anything. I can't see where the person's really threatened or pushed or others. But what had happened was it was a male for, with a female. The male was speaking to, to, to this female staff member and he positioned himself where she was basically unable to get around him and move. So he had basically impeded the person from moving. So she was forced to stay there for with him and continue this conversation. So physical type of harassing and bullying as well. It's not just about that pushing, shoving, striking, like for these sort of things. It's those sort of examples as well. And as I said, that, that's why I want you to have that broader and deeper understanding about the, what, you know, what's considered the inappropriate conduct. The non-verbal can be the leering, staring, um, glaring, like you know, these sort of things, making gestures, looking somebody up and down as well. And from the visual point of view, as mentioned, that can be showing things on phone or others on social media. If you've got in professional relationships or dynamics that starts to head down a bad path, if people um, sometimes use um, ver uh, like your visual items as a bit of a leading to see if somebody is open to these sort of discussions of a more adult or salacious type nature. So showing images or content as well, like some of the things that can occur. Any of these forms in here, if it makes the person feel like, you know, like obviously like um, embarrassed, humiliated, intimidated or others is inappropriate sexual conduct and cannot occur. So there's some other examples on this um, slide here as well. Cat calls, wolf whistles, these sort of things, sexual in your, in your, in your endo, texting, pornography and others. So as I said, that visual element for things in that as well. With the current dynamic, another part, um, that social relational bullying and also from the cyber point of view, so the visual when it comes to some of the sexual harassing behaviour are two of the more common items, I suppose, that, like, that, that can occur and especially where there's not good leadership. So... We need to make sure at all times we're 100% clear on what is considered acceptable behaviour and conduct and then we adhere to that. It's part of having that respectful, positive and safe workplace. Sexually suggestive um, comments or jokes, things on the phone, email, social media, those sort of things. And then obviously look, the flow on from that is um, touching, hugging, kissing, all those sort of things. Some people are naturally hands contact people when they talk, they like, you know, they like to have their hand on someone's shoulders and arms for these sort of things as well. And it's really important to understand about the reception for with that, about that just because that's the way that you like to communicate or that you're comfortable with communicating doesn't mean that the person you're interacting with the ball lucky with that same type of approach or interaction as well. Some of the other items can occur about questions about private, you know, private, private life for things and that as well. So you can questions about relationships. Oh, like you've got this new boyfriend. Have you guys done this or done yet? Done that yet? All, all those sort of things, coupled with uh, things I said, you know, the, the sexual gestures and, and a range of other things. All these sort of things is inappropriate, like your conduct and and forms like um, sexual harassment. So as I said, we need to make sure that at all times. We're acting, we are professional, um, professionally courteous and friendly, not familiar, which is, I think is another really important part um, as well. So quid pro quo sexual harassment I mentioned before, which is in essence when um, it's this type of sexual harassment where somebody who's in a position of authority offers, tries to trade um, benefits, like for things as well, for some type of sexual favour. It doesn't mean just physical, sexual behaviour and conduct. It can be, and it has occurred, in circumstances um, like you know, for people offering these um, benefits and other parts for photos or, or a range of other things. So this sort of uh, sexual harassment occurs when you've got somebody who is a superior and often towards a somebody who is like, you know, you're one of their direct reports or, or staff because they're offering additional benefits. That can be things such as more shifts here, like, you know, time off for public holidays, better working conditions, access to, to, to different things as well. So a specific type of sexual harassment as well that, like I said, often like, you know, is that occurs with um, with superiors or, or leaders. 
so I've mentioned a couple of times now about, you know, in essence, you know, the person, if you're you know, in these conversations or interactions about you decide what is harassment and what's inappropriate conduct as well. If during communication or other parts, the behaviour or conduct that you're witnessing or being involved in that you find as being offensive, um, humiliating, intimidating, and relates to obviously any of the items that we've covered off, sex, race, religion, sexual origin, political party, any of these other, other items as well, um, then if that's making you feel that way, then that is inappropriate conduct that be considered harassment. doesn't matter how the harasser or anybody else perceives the conduct. I gave the example, if they've got four people here, one person's telling a joke, three people listening. If that one person say, oh, yeah, like, yeah, feels and makes them feel humiliated, intimidated or other parts, then it is that inappropriate conduct. And as I said, because we're all individuals, we've got different life experiences, different makeup and others, it means that our perspective sometimes or our line as to what we may deem inappropriate can be different others. But that's why we need to have that open communication as well, just to reiterate the fact that we support each other's differences and respect each other's values and those differences and opinions as well. So who can be the target? I mean, the natural part for with this that people go to is thinking that it's going to be between a superior and a subordinate um, and like you're directly working in the workplace. Nothing could be further from the truth. Between suppliers, customers sometimes coming in, like you have things in that as well, superiors to subordinates, subordinates to superiors, anybody can be, can, can be the target if with this type of um, bullying, harassing or discriminating type behaviour. Um, and, and from that perspective, that's why it's important. So for the leaders and managers that are listening to this, that we're across and monitoring the, the dynamic, like uh, yeah, the vibe within like, the, the workplace as well, and, and monitoring those interactions to make sure these things are not, are not occurring. So similarly, who can be the perpetrator of this type of behavioural conduct? Co-workers, supervisors, managers, other people that are suppliers or other parts that come like that are coming to the site. If you know one of the people listening to this is from that retail type environment, you've got um, delivery drivers, like you're, you're coming, other logistics partners, trades, like that comes to the site. All these sort of things as well that have regular interaction. Uh, you for with our workplace and with, and the people within it. So. When I say about it's important for monitoring the relationship dynamic, the interactions and the engagements, it's not just about your direct team or your direct reports and people there as well. It's the interactions that happen within your sphere of influence and also your realm of accountability. So some of the things we must do, some basic ones, they, these are some good clear, clear takeaways for you. We must be aware of the language we use and its impact on others. Just because we may use certain words, you know, verbiage, sometimes swearing and things at home or in personal dynamics or others, doesn't mean we can continue on with that communication through in the workplace. As I said, we need to be mindful of how it's how our communication is received and those different um, values, opinions, or like the other people we're dealing with. We can't use that um, it's just a joke as an excuse. That oh, it's just a new person, and like you know, like in essence, you know, that's just a bit of a bit of a joke. You'll see uh, in a couple of slides when I talk about the people that most that that have traits that sometimes can fall victim more regularly to being bullying, harassing, um, and feeling isolated are newer people sometimes to an organisation because they haven't joined with the group or click yet, and a range of other things. And if they have some slight differences about that, like you know, compared to others, then they can become the target. And so saying things that are just a joke as an excuse for that is not acceptable. And sometimes it's the thoughtless remarks as well. Um, one of the situations previously, so this is probably about five or six years ago now, um, that I was asked to help like if with an organisation um, that had another claim, I was giving them some advice and it was a um, register club, a large register club. And one of the female staff members was helping um, the male um, main manager there, the general manager there with the delivery that they've got. And as part of that, when the female staff member went to say, oh, here, I'll move these kegs. And the manager had said, uh, you know, you're just a girl, you can't lift those. Like, yeah, yeah, so, you know, get out of the way, let a man do it. Although there wasn't, uh, you know, upon review, main bad intent behind that communication, the fact the reception for that, um, look at like it was, was taken very, very negatively and became quite a substantial issue for things as well. And that's why I'm saying sometimes the communication even if you may think you're doing it in jest, you need to be very mindful of it and about the reception of it for with the people that you're going to be dealing with as well. We must also act professionally with honesty and transparency, which is absolutely crucial, and consistency, consistent in approach. 
you don't act differently or treat people differently just because you've worked with that person longer or like that person better. Uh, we need to be consistent in our approach, like in making sure that same level or as I, can, I say, consistency and courtesy and respect that needs to occur throughout. We need to make sure that we're also accountable for our actions and for our inactions, because sometimes in these circumstances, like, like if we witness elements of this behavior and not doing anything about it, then you're complicit in this behavior occurring like within the workplace. That's another really important point to understand. For the managers and leaders that are listening to this as well, you know, we're in charge of helping deliver and work through these, especially in times of stress and duress. And when complaints are raised in regards to, to uh, intimidating, like your harassing behavior and others, they can be quite emotive circumstances to be dealing with for the entire team and often for you personally as well. But we need to be consistent in our approach, transparent in the way that we deal with it at, at all times. So some other examples, and I thought I'll put some slides up here so you can see um, that although there's you know different states, countries, like how they communicate, there's some key recurring themes and things here. So what can we do to stop these things occurring in the workplace? Uh, make sure everyone's acting in a respectful and professional manner with how they're communicating with people. Have that right, like the program in place and the framework and procedures and make sure we're consistent with it. Treat all reports seriously, investigate them promptly and confidentiality and confidentially. So the same things that I've said throughout, um, uh, same as like, 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 you know, so globally, the same approach, honesty, transparency and consistency, but it needs to be underpinned and supported by the fact that the organizational culture has that zero tolerance acceptance of these things occurring and that every situation where this is raised is going to be reviewed 100%, um, like, yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah, and you're promptly efficiently and transparently. So some other parts I, I suppose that I wanted to cover off were some people that, that may potentially be more at risk of being bullied as well in and around the workplace. It doesn't mean just because these people have any or all of these attributes that they are getting bullied, but just places them more at risk. So people that may be slightly different that look at, look at to their peers in, in approach, dress, attire, or other parts in that as well, um, can unfortunately be more at risk sometimes of being bullied within the workplace people that have lower self-esteem or anxious or just don't have those um, overzealous, like your rapport, like your, like your friend building type skills and others, because they can come in being a little bit cautious, anxious and isolated. And if they're not well received within the team, regardless of the team or workplace or work site that you're in, they can be more potentially like a risk from, from that bullying behavior and conduct. So for the managers and leaders that said, you know, that, that are listening to this, uh, that's why we need to be really mindful of how we manage inductions and commencement with people, regardless if it's a two-person team or a 50-person team, that we do all we can to make sure that that awareness of the organisational culture flows through um, like with everybody involved and that um, as part of from the, for the values as well, that it's, not, it's reiterated regularly so the entire workplace knows about the fact that we're accepting of each other's values, differences and other parts. And as I said, if at any time any behaviour occurs that would be considered harassing, bullying, discriminating behaviour, that the workplace knows that they can raise this without any form of reprisal or others because we want to investigate, review and close these matters off because that's how we ensure a positive workplace. We have zero tolerance to it occurring and we adhere to our policies and guidelines like you're lucky consistently to make sure that we work through should these circumstances occur. From a location point of view, uh, you know, another point to mention is about the fact that it doesn't just occur in your immediate work site. If you're working at a retail site, corporate site or whatever, it doesn't just occur there. Sometimes if there's workplace functions, conferences, parties, training sessions or things as well, you're in and around the dynamic still for with like, you know, these people from the workplace, but sometimes in a social setting, if it's a dinner or drinks or these sort of things as well, then sometimes that can further exacerbate that. So from that perspective, um, is to, to, to understand that at all times we need to be consistent and when I say that consistency and courtesy as well, but also from that professional respect uh, in how we manage ourselves. When I'm teaching the customer service parts, I say we treat people always like ladies and gentlemen, not because they are, but because we are. It's the same with dealing and interacting for, with our team. Um, so we need to be, be um, consistent in, in how we do that. Sex stereotyping, I, I mentioned a little bit before, but it's when basically harassing somebody uh, because they don't conform to the gender stereotypes or from the duty point of view as well, that may be not around and, you know, because those duties may not be done by somebody of that gender. So this can be called sex discrimination. 
The example I gave before about for doing the delivery and the keg delivery and others as well, that's a really clear example of that. Um, we're based on the fact that that manager's communication had been um, purely that had been um, based on uh, their perception as to who would be responsible for with that job. So from the retaliation perspective, um, you know, that and I mentioned before about from the protected activities for covering off, two points I want to mention for with this. When I say about from protected activities, so anybody who is raising the concerns or complaints, if they're providing evidence or information for um, a situation where a complaint has been lodged or the follow-up actions for with that, it's protected activity. So by law, they can't get any type of repercussions or reprisal um, from, from the organisation or employer for doing that. So this can occur in a range of different ways, um, things changing the work schedule, location, demotion, uh, pay cuts, not the same accessibility or other items that they may have originally had been training programs or others, all these sort of things. And as I said, it's a key part of the organizational culture. We need to make sure, and especially like for the, you know, the managers, supervisors, leaders within here as well, that we understand that, you know, in essence, we, we're vicariously liable for the flow on uh, like, uh, of these things occurring in and around the workplace. And, and I know I've reiterated that, but it's just because it's, it's so absolutely crucial that the workplace needs to know um, and everybody within it that if they're at any time feeling that in, uh, feeling intimidated, harassed, bullied, discriminated, that they can, without reprisal or any fear of reprisal or actions, raise this and it will be reviewed professionally, confidentially and promptly. Um, that's how we follow through on, that, on having the zero tolerance. You know, like he's making sure that we like you know, that you know, our actions, you know, our words turn into actions that we follow through for with this. So the training, the awareness piece, like you know, that that's how that that's how on the flow on with information and flow on of information, such as even this training session, that's how we maintain like you know, that that positive organizational culture. That's how we progress through to make sure that that everybody within our organization feels equally supported um, as well. And as I said, that you know everyone's aware of how much we value the you know the individual differences that we have uh, and that we what we bring to the workplace. So from the management and leadership point of view, um, so firstly, and if you may be somebody who is feeling like you're suffering this, your manager's responsibility, or if you are a manager or leader who's listening to this, your responsibility is making sure that we're reporting any of this behavior and conduct. Um, and because we're responsible, not just for the ones that are reported to us, behavior and conduct that we should reasonably have known about, we're responsible and accountable for as well. So we need to make sure we're modeling the appropriate right behavior, or as I said, walking the talk in how we engage, how we interact for things as well, maintaining and sticking for with those values and making sure that we're communicating to that broader team around us as well, the importance of that positive and supportive culture and the awareness, like, like in clarity about the fact that um, the, of the need for reporting should any of this sort of behavior or conduct occur. So from the reporting point of view, the mandatory reporting elements that we have, like, have in place. So supervisor managers, if you're aware of it, it's mandatory reporting guidelines. So should something happen like yeah, that, that you become aware of this type of behavior or conduct for things as well, that it needs to be re uh, recorded, reported, and the follow-up actions like, yeah, like yeah, yeah, that you know, occurred. Should that not happen? So if you're aware of this sort of behavior and actions and you don't progress through this, then there 100% would be follow-up disciplinary action with regards to this. I can't say any clearer that as an organization, Southern Cross has 100% zero tolerance for this type of behavior and conduct occurring. And we will, you know, I said, enforce that through the right policy and procedure framework, the supportive information through training and development, but by the consistent messaging throughout our people as well to make sure. So if you are somebody who's feeling um, harassed, intimidated, bullied for these sort of things as well, then obviously like the logical first thing is uh, for communicating through your chain of command, through your supervisor or manager, or if that person is a person that you're having the issue with, then escalating that through the chain of command. We'll then obviously make sure that then through our HR department, executive management, that the proper process is followed. And as I said, every individual complaint treated on its own merits, treated as serious and investigated and actioned appropriately. And as mentioned earlier, there's obviously, there's that flowing um, chain then through to look at the industry regulators and other parts, should you not feel um, that the matter's not progressed um, efficiently and, you know, and transparently as well. But as it says, like as well there, don't you know? Don't be afraid to ask for help. 
And as I mentioned earlier in the piece about speaking up, because you know, I said this is, this is absolutely crucial. It's the backbone of what we need to have in place with this. So if you're witnessing harassment, the same thing is making sure that we're communicating it. If you're aware of harassing, like okay, look at this type of harassing, bullying, intimidating, like your behavior, inappropriate conduct occurring, and you do nothing about it, then you are complicit in that behavior occurring. And that has a direct flow into our organizational culture. So see something, say something. I couldn't be any clearer like are you for that as well. We're obviously already covered off about for, you know, look at the unlawful from, from a um from an ability for retaliating against um, staff members for like for, for raising this under their protected activities. But as I said, key points for taking out of that slide is if you see something, say something. We need to make sure that it's communicated and action through. The follow-up flow on action for that, and when it comes to the investigation, is you know to make sure that everybody's aware of some of the specifics. Any investigations, uh, like you acted um, in a professional, uh, unbiased manner, like you're obviously to the to the extent possible. During that time, um, like you through the investigation, if firstly if you're a manager or leader involved with this, the importance of consistency in approach and also promptly managing these things. Sometimes complaints of this sort of nature can there can be some delays because as a leader or manager, if you're not used to or experienced with dealing with these type of complaints, or if there's elements you're trying to work out the actual individual dynamic and the best way to approach. And that's why you know, we have that consistent you know, policy and procedure framework with managing, with managing these. And as I said, and if in doubt, then ask your direct report for some support advice and others with, man with managing this, because we need to make sure that all elements the framework, um, the actual process for how these, like yeah, this is all managed, as I said, is consistent, transparent, and confidential throughout. So some of the examples as to like you know what some of the behaviour can occur based on. So what can be some of the um, driving elements for your behaviour from a discrimination where it can occur? Age, race, colour, national origin, um, domestic violence, um, victim status as well, disability, a range of elements. Regardless of that, regardless of what um, base area or sector, like a, that, that can be the commencement item for this type for any sort of this type of harassing or discriminating behaviour. Southern Cross Group has a 100% zero tolerance approach to that. So, just wanted to give some clarity into some of the reasons, and especially for you know, for those that are leaders, managers, or supervisors, what can be some of the elements that can that can, where you know, where this behavioural conduct can stem from. So, what to do? Should the situation occur, or you were involved, like you're like or aware of with this situation, act promptly. Don't sit on information if you're aware. And as you know, I've said throughout this, see something, say something is absolutely crucial. Passing that information on, that lack of information, like like or, or progression for with this, in essence, is you saying that you're accepting of this behaviour and conduct. So. All matters you know, will get treated seriously. They all get reviewed, assessed, and investigated properly with an unbiased investigation, because that is the only way to make sure um, that it's acted like, like appropriately and like and, and thoroughly as well. Procedural fairness and confidentiality are obviously crucial. And that's why we had that structured approach to ensure consistency in approach, whether it's somebody who's been working with us for one month or five years, uh, the same process, same record keeping process and others. Um, as I look at looking at like it occurs. And keeping records is another point, which is a great segue into that point, making sure that, uh, especially if you're the manager or leader dealing with this, that you're maintaining thorough records of this at all times. If they, when the complaint was made, who made it when it was made, who it was made to, the details of the complaint, if there's follow-up discussions, interactions and others, keep detailed notes with those. There's been situations occur where there's been um, you know, harassing behavior, things occur. There's been an initial follow-up review and investigation and all parties had considered the matter being closed. And then a couple of weeks later, something else has flared up. And if you haven't got detailed notes and other parts to refer back to on processing key elements can make the process even worse. So for protecting yourself, the organizational reputation and the actual integrity of your process, keep detailed notes throughout is a really like an important part for how we manage this. So how do we stop this type of behavior, bullying, discriminating, harassing? I mean, we've touched on, on points around like on how we manage this. Having this, the structured, robust policy and procedure framework is one part, but regardless on if we've got the nice shiny manual, the very clear procedures, listening to this webinar, like that you're doing for things that now, that all means nothing if it's not supported by the organizational culture. 
our values need to be aligned, our actions need to be aligned, you know, for, for with this content. Organizational culture means people gravitate to the way things are done around here, not just about like what's in the manual of procedure and guidelines. So we need to walk the talk. These things about making sure that the workplace knows that they're supported and they can raise issues of bullying, harassment, or discriminating behavior is we need to, we, we stick to that. That's part of our DNA. Um, so we need to make sure that that flows on. It's not just a policy or something like on, on paper. It's what, it's what we, what we believe in and, and, and how we act. So providing training, like, like you know, such as this and, and, and a follow-up elements, covering off elements like if with the flow on toolbox talks and other parts, empowering our people to know, making a part of our induction that here is our culture about how we work and how we value each other's opinion, like opinions, approach, values and differences as well. Monitoring the workplace and the culture is, is a key part and, and, and part of it is just making sure not just we just get framework in place and get a policy in, in place, but we review and improve that as well is another really important part. Because you know, previously I've dealt with organisations where I say, "Oh, if you've got policies around this," and say, "Yeah, yeah, we've got something in place," and it's two thousand and nine. It's not aligned with their current organisational framework or, or, or landscape or anything now. Um, completely just ineffective. So it's getting these procedures, framework, and training in place, and making sure it's current. Making sure that our documentation, our training, is reflective of what we do and who we are currently, not just who we were. The final point I mentioned for with this is that I always share some points with regards to, to mental health support. That's not just for the people that if you're actually um, feeling and, and suffering from um, bullying, harassing or intimidating type behaviour, it's also for the people that manage and deal with some of these circumstances because they can be quite challenging, like I can direct for things as well. So at all times, feel free to um, to, to, to reach out uh, like to any of these services for getting some additional support, you know, should at any time uh, this information uh, or what you're dealing with make you feel, um, you know, obviously like you're unwell, stressed, anxious or other parts as well. It's really important to make sure that that we're aware of that, that you have access uh, it's to those services. So I hope you've got some good benefit and takeaways like out of this. And please, as always, reach out to supervisors, managers, others, direct reports for any more information, support and advice in these areas. Thank you.